The Hunger Games, Chapter 7 My slumbers are filled with disturbing dreams. The face of the red-headed girl intertwines with gory images from earlier Hunger Games, with my mother withdrawn and unreachable, with prim, emaciated, and terrified. I bolt up screaming for my father to run as the mine explodes into a million deadly lids of light. Dawn is breaking through the windows. The capital has a misty, haunted air. My head aches, and I must have bitten into the side of my cheek in the night. My tongue probes the ragged flesh, and I taste blood. Slowly, I drag myself out of bed and into the shower. I arbitrarily punch buttons on the control board and end up hopping from foot to foot as alternating jets of icy cold and steaming hot water assault me. Then I'm deluged in lemony foam that I have to scrape off of a heavy bristle brush. Oh well, at least my blood is flowing. When I'm dried and moisturized with lotion, I find an outfit has been left for me at the front of the closet. Tight black pants, a long sleeve burgundy tunic, and leather shoes. I put my hair in a single braid down my back. This is the first time since the morning of the reaping that I resemble myself. No fancy hair and clothes, no flaming capes, just me, looking like I could be headed for the woods. It calms me. Hamish didn't give us an exact time to meet for breakfast, and no one has contacted me this morning, but I'm hungry, so I head down to the dining room, hoping there will be food. I'm not disappointed. While the table is empty, a long board off to the side has been laid with at least 20 dishes. A young man, an Avox, stands at attention by the spread. When I ask if I can serve myself, he nods assent. I load a plate with eggs, sausages, batter cakes covered in thick orange preserves, slices of pale purple melon. As I gorge myself, I watch the sun rise over the capital. I have a second plate of hot grains smothered in beef stew. Finally, I fill a plate with rolls and sit at the table, breaking oil bits and dipping them into hot chocolate, the way Peter did on the train. My mind water wanders to my mother and Prim. They must be up. My mother getting their breakfast of mush, Prim milking her goat before school. Just two mornings ago, I was home. Can that be right? Yeah, just two. And now how empty the house feels, even from a distance. What did they say last night about my fire debut of the games? Did it give them hope, or simply add to their terror when they saw the reality of 24 tributes circled together, knowing only one could live? Hey, Mitch and Peta come in, bid me good morning, fill their plates. It makes me irritated that Peta is wearing exactly the same outfit I am. I need to say something to Cinna. This twins act is going to blow up in our faces once the games begin. Surely, they must know this. Then I remember Hamish telling me to do exactly what the stylists tell me to do. If it was anyone but Cinna, I might be tempted to ignore him. But after last night's triumph, I don't have a lot of room to criticize his choices. I'm nervous about the training. There will be three days in which all the tributes practice together. On the last afternoon, we'll each get a chance to perform in private before the game makers. The thought of meeting the other tributes face to face makes me queasy. I turn... The roll I have just taken from the basket over and over in my hands, but my appetite is gone. When Hamish has finished several platters of stew, he pushes back his plate with a sigh. He takes a flask from his pocket and takes a long pull on it and leans his elbows on the table. So, let's get down to business. Training. First off, if you like, I'll coach you separately. Decide now. Why would you coach us separately, I ask. Say if you had a secret skill you might not want the other to know about, says Hamish. I exchange a look with Peta. I don't have any secret skills, he says, and I already know what yours is, right? I mean, I've eaten enough of your squirrels. I never thought about Peta eating the squirrels I shot. Somehow I always picture the baker quietly going off and frying them up for himself. Not out of greed, but because town families usually eat expensive butcher meat, beef and chicken and horse. You can coach us together, I tell Hamish. Peta nods. All right. So give me some idea of what you can do, says Hamish. I can't do anything, says Peta, unless you count baking bread. Sorry, I don't. Katniss, I already know you're handy with a knife, says Hamish. Not really, but I can hunt, I say, with a bow and arrow. And you're good, asks Hamish. I have to think about it. I've been putting food on the table for four years. That's no small task. I'm not as good as my father was, but he had more practice. I'm better, I better, than, I better aim than Gale, but I've had more practice. He's a genius with traps and snares. I'm all right, I say. 
She's excellent, says Peta. My father buys her squirrels. He always comments on how the arrow never pierced the body. She hits everyone in the eye. It's the same with the rabbit she sells the butcher. She can even bring down deer. This assessment of my skills from Peta takes me totally by surprise. First, that he ever noticed. Second, that he's talking me up. What are you doing? I ask him suspiciously. What are you doing? If he's going to help you, he has to know what you're capable of. Don't under don't un don't underrate yourself, says Peta. I don't know why, but this rubs me the wrong way. What about you? I've seen you in the market. You can lift hundred pound bags of flour. I snap at him, tell him that. That's that's not nothing. Yes, and I'm sure the arena will be full of bags of flour for me to chuck at people. It's not like being able to use a weapon. You know it isn't. He shoots back. He can wrestle, I tell Hamish. He came in second in our school competition last year, only after his brother. What use is that? How many times have you seen that someone wrestle someone to death, says Peter in disgust. There's always hand-to-hand -hand combat. All you need is to come up with a knife, and you'll at least stand a chance. If I get jumped, I'm dead. I can hear my voice rising in anger. But you won't. You'll be living up in some tree, eating raw squirrels and picking off people with arrows. You know what my mother said to me when she came to say goodbye, as if to cheer me up? She says maybe District 12 will finally have a winner. Then I realized she didn't mean me. She meant you, burst out Peter. Oh, she meant you, I say with a wave of dismissal. She said, she's a survivor, that one. She is, says Peter. That pulls me up short. Did his mother really say that about me? Did she rate me over her son? I see the pain in Peter's eyes and know he isn't lying. Suddenly I'm behind the bakery and I can feel the chill of the rain running down my back, the hollowness in my belly. I sound 11 years old when I speak, but only because someone helped me. Peter's eyes flicker down to the roll in my hands and I know he remembers that day too, but he just shrugs. People will help you in the arena. They'll be tripping over each other to sponsor you. No more than you, I say. Peter rolls his eyes at Hamish. She has no idea, the effect she can have. He runs his fingernails along the wood grain of the table, refusing to look at me. What on earth does he mean? People help me? When we were dying of starvation, no one helped me. No one except Peta. Once I had something to barter with, things changed. I'm a tough trader. Or am I? What effect do I have? That I'm weak and needy? Is he suggesting that I got good deals because people pitied me? I try to think if this is true. Perhaps some of the merchants were a little generous in their trades, but I always attributed that to their long-standing relationship with my father. Besides, my game is first class. No one pitied me. I glower at the role. Sure, he meant to insult me. After about a minute of this, Heyman says, Well then, well, well, well. Katniss, there's no guarantee there'll be bows and arrows in the arena. But during your private session with the game maker, show them what you can do. Until then, stay clear of archery. Are you... Any good at trapping? I know a few basic snares, I mutter. That may be significant in terms of food, says Hamish. And Peta, she's right, never under underestimate strength in the arena. Very often, physical power tilts the advantage to a player. In the training center, they will have weights, but, I don't, re but don't reveal how much you can lift in front of the other tributes. The plan's the same for both of you. You go to group training, spend the time trying to learn something you don't know. Throw a spear, swing a mace, learn to tie a decent knot, Safe showing what you're best at until your private sessions. Are we clear? Says Hamish. Peter and I nod. One last thing. In public, I want you by each other's side every minute, says Hamish. We both start to object, but Hamish slams his hand on the table. Every minute. It's not open for discussion. You agreed to do as I said. You will be together. You will appear amiable to each other. Now get out. Meet Effie at the elevator at 10 for training. I bite my lip and stalk back to my room, making sure Peta can hear the door slam. I sit on the bed, hating Hamish, hating Peta, hating myself for mentioning that day long ago in the rain. It's such a joke. Peta and I going along, pretending to be friends, talking up each other's strengths, insisting the other take credit for their abilities. Because in fact, at some point, we're going to have to knock it off and accept we're bitter adversaries, which I'd be prepared to do right now if it wasn't for Hamish's stupid instruction that we stick together in training. It's my own fault, I guess, for telling him he didn't have to coach us separately. But that didn't mean I wanted to do everything with Peta, who, by the way, clearly doesn't want to be partnering up with me either. I hear Peta's voice in my head. She has no idea. The effect she can have. Obviously meant to demean me, right? But a tiny part of me wonders if this was a compliment, that he meant I was appealing in some way. 
it's weird how much he's noticed me, like the attention he's paid to my hunting. And apparently I had not been as oblivious to him as I imagined either. The flower, the wrestling, I've kept track of the boy with the bread. It's almost 10. I clean my teeth and smooth back my hair again. Anger temporarily blocked out of my nervousness about meeting the other tributes, but now I can feel my anxiety rising again. By the time I meet Effie and Pete on the elevator, I catch myself biting my nails. I stop at once. The actual training rooms are below ground level of our building. With these elevators, the ride is less than a minute. The doors open into an enormous gymnasium filled with various weapons and obstacle courses. Although it's not yet 10, we're the, the last ones to arrive. The other tributes are gathered in a tense circle. They each have a cloth square with their district number on it pinned to their shirts while someone pins the number 12 on my back. I do a quick assessment. Pete and I are the only two dressed alike. As soon as we join the circle, the head trainer, a tall athletic woman named Atala, steps up and begins to explain the training schedule. Experts in each skill will remain at their stations. We will be free to travel from arena to arena area to area as we choose per our mentor's instructions. Some of the stations teach survival skills, others fighting techniques. We are forbidden to engage in any com um, combative exercise with another tribute. There are assistants on hand if we want to practice with a partner. When Atala begins to read down the list of the skill stations, my eyes can't help flitting around to the other tributes. It's the first time we've been assembled on level ground in simple clothes. My heart sinks. Almost all the boys and at least half of the girls are bigger than I am. Even though many of the tributes have never been fed properly. You can see it in their bones, their skin, the hollow look in their eyes. I may be smaller naturally, but overall my family's resourcefulness has given me an edge in that area. I stand straight and while I'm thin, I'm strong. The meat and plants from the woods combined with the exertion it took to get them have given me a healthier body than most of, these I see, most of those I see around me. The exceptions are the kids from the wealthier districts, the volunteers, the ones who have been fed and trained throughout their lives for this moment. The tributes from 1, 2, and 4 traditionally have this look about them. It's technically against the rules to train tributes before they reach the capital, but it happens every year. In District 12, we call them career tributes, or just careers. And like, and like as not, the winner will be one of them. The slight advantage I held... Coming into the training center, my fiery entrance last night seems to vanish in the presence of my competition. The other tributes were jealous of us, but not because we were amazing, because our stylists were. Now I see nothing but contempt in the glances of the career tributes. Each must have 50 to 100 pounds on me. They project arrogance and brutality. When Atala reaches us, reach, releases us, they head straight for the deadliest looking weapons in the gym and handle them with ease. I'm thinking that it's lucky I'm a fast runner when Peter nudges my arm and I jump. He is still beside me, per Hamish's instructions. His expression is sober. Where would you like to start? I look around at the center at the I'm sorry. I look around at the career tributes who are showing off, clearly trying to intimidate the field, then at the others, the underfed, the incompetent, shakily having their first lessons with a knife or an axe. I suppose we tie some knots, I say. Right you are, says Peta. We cross through an empty station where the trainer seems pleased to have students. You get the feeling that the knot tying class is not the Hunger Games hotspot. When he realizes I know something about snares, he shows us a simple, excellent trap that will leave a human competitor dangling by a leg from a tree. We concentrate on this one skill for an hour until both of us have mastered it. Then we move on to camouflage. Peta genuinely sees, seems to enjoy this station swirling a combination of mud and clay and berry juices around on his pale skin, weaving disguises from vines and leaves. The trainer who runs the camouflage station is full of enthusiasm at his work. I do the cakes, he admits to me. The cakes, I ask. I've been preoccupied with watching the boy from District 2 send a spear through a dummy's heart from 15 yards. What cakes? At home, the ice ones for the bakery, he says. He means the ones they display in the windows. Fancy cakes with flowers and pretty things painted in frosting. They're for birthdays and New Year's Day. When we're in the square, Prim always drags me over to admire them, although we never be able to afford one. There's a little enough there's little enough beauty in District 12, though, so I can hardly deny her this. I look more critically at the design on Peter's arm. The alternating pattern of light and dark suggests sunlight falling through the leaves of the woods. 
I wonder how he knows this, since I doubt he's ever been beyond the fence. Has he been able to pick this up from just that scraggly old apple tree in his backyard? Somehow the whole thing, his skill, those inaccessible cakes, the praise of the camouflage expert annoys me. It's lovely. If only you could frost someone to death, I say. Don't be so superior. You can never tell what you'll find in the arena. S say it's actually a gigantic cake, begins Peta. Say we move on, I break in. So the next three days pass with Peta and I going quietly from station to station. We do pick up some valuable skills from starting fires to knife throwing to making shelter. Despite Hamish's order to appear mediocre, Peta excels in hand-to-hand -hand combat and I sweep the edible plants test without blinking an eye. We steer clear of archery and weightlifting, though, wanting to save those for our private sessions. The game makers appeared early on the first day. Twenty or so men and women dressed in deep purple robes. They sit in the elevated stands that surround the gymnasium, sometimes wandering about to watch us, jotting down notes, other times eating at the endless banquet that has been set for them, ignoring the lot of us. But they do seem to be keeping their eye on District 12 tributes. Several times I've looked up to find one fixated on me. They consult with the trainers during our meals as well. We see them all gathered together when we come back. Breakfast and dinner are served on our floor, but at lunch, the 24 of us eat in a dining room off the gymnasium. Food is arranged on carts around the room, and you serve yourself. The career tributes tend to gather routedly around one table as if to prove their superiority that they have no fear of one another and consider the rest of us beneath notice. Most of the other tributes sit alone, like lost sheep. No one says a word to us. Pete and I eat together, and since Hamish keeps dogging us about it, try to keep up a friendly conversation during the meals. It's not easy to find a topic. Talking of home is painful. Talking of the present unbearable. One day, Pete empties our bread basket and points out how they have been careful to include types from the districts along with the refined bread of the capital, the fish-shaped loaf tinted green with seaweed from District 4, the crescent moon roll dotted with seeds from District 11. Somehow, although it's made from the same stuff, it looks a lot more appetizing than the ugly drop brisket biscuits that are the standard fare at home. And there you have it, says Peter, scooping the breads back in the basket. You certainly know a lot, I say. Only about bread, he says. Okay, now laugh as if I've said something funny. We both give a somewhat convincing laugh and ignore the stares from around the room. All right, I'll keep smiling pleasantly and you talk, says Peter. It's wearing us both out, Hamish's direction to be friendly, because ever since I slammed my door, there's been a chill in the air between us. But we have our orders. Did I ever tell you about the time I was chased by a bear, I ask? No, but it sounds fascinating, says Peter. I try and animate my face as I recall the event, a true story in which I foolishly challenge a black bear over the rights of a beehive. Peter laughs and asks questions, right on cue. He's much better at this than I am. On the second day, while we're taking a shot at spear throwing, he whispers to me, I think we have a shadow. I throw my spear, which I'm not too bad at actually, if I don't have to throw too far, and see the little girl from District 11 standing back a bit, watching us. She's the 12-year-old, the one who reminded me so of Prim in stature. Up close, she looks about 10. She has bright, dark eyes, satiny brown skin, and stands tilted up on her toes while her arms slightly extended to her sides, as if ready to take wing at the slightest sound. It's impossible not to think of a bird. I pick up another spear while Peter throws. I think her name's Rue, he says softly. I bite my lip. Rue is a small yellow flower that grows in the metal. Rue, primrose. Neither of them could tip the scale of 70 pounds soaking wet. What can we do about it, I ask him more harshly than I intended. Nothing to do, he says back, just making conversation. Now that I know she's there, it's hard to ignore the child. She slips up and joins us at different stations. Like me, she's clever with plants, climbs swiftly, and has good aim. She can hit the target every time with a slingshot. But what is a slingshot against a 220-pound male of a sword? Back on District 12... Back on the District 12 floor, Hamish and Effie grill us throughout breakfast and dinner about every moment of the day. What we did, who watched us, how the other tributes size up. Cinna and Portia aren't around, so there's no one to add any sanity to the meals. Not that Hamish and Effie are fighting anymore. Instead, they seem to be of one mind, determined to whip us into shape, full of endless directions about what we should do and not do in the training. Peta is more patient, but I become fed up and, and surely. When we finally escape 
to bed on the second night, Pete mumbles, someone ought to get Hamish a drink. I make a sound that is somewhere between a snort and a laugh, then catch myself. It's messing with my mind too much, trying to keep straight when we're supposedly friends and then when we're not. At least when we get into the arena, I'll know where we stand. Don't, don't, let's pretend when, don't, uh, sorry, don't, don't, let's pretend when there's no one around. All right, Katniss, he says tiredly. After that, we only talk in front of the people. On the third day of training, they start to call us out of lunch for our private sessions with the game makers. District by district, first the boy, then the girl tribute. As usual, District 12 is slated to go last. We linger in the dining room, unsure where else to go. No one comes back once they have left. As the room empties, the pressure to appear friendly lightens. By the time they call Rue, we are left alone. We sit in silence until they summon Peta. He rises. Remember what Hamish said about being sure to throw the weights. The words come out of my mouth without permission. Thanks, I will, he says. You shoot straight. I nod. I don't know why I said anything at all. Although, if I'm going to lose, I'd rather Peta win than the others. Better for our district. For my mother and Prim. After about 15 minutes, they call my name. I smooth my hair, set my shoulders back, and walk into the gymnasium. Instantly, I know I'm in trouble. They've been here too long, the game makers. Sat through 23 other demonstrations. Had too much, had too much wine, most of them. Want more than anything to go home. There's nothing I can do but continue with the plan. I walk to the archery station. Oh, the weapons. I've been itching to get my hands on them for days. Bows made of wood and plastic and metal and materials I can't even name. Arrows with feathers cut in flawless uniform lines. I choose a bow, string it, and sling the matching quiver of arrows over my shoulder. There's a shooting range, but it's much too limited. Standard bullseye and a human silhouettes. I walk to the center of the gymnasium and pick my first target, the dummy used for knife practice. Even as I pull back on the bow, I know something is wrong. The string's tighter than the one I use at home. The arrow is more rigid. I miss the dummy by a couple of inches and lose what I, little attention I had been con commanding. For a moment, I'm humiliated. Then I head back to the bullseye. I shoot again and again until I get the feel of these new weapons. Back in the center of the gymnasium, I take my initial position and skewer the dummy right through the heart. Then I sever the rope that holds the sandbag for boxing, and the bag splits open as it slams to the ground. Without pausing, I shoulder roll forward, come up on one knee, and send an arrow into one of the hanging lights high above the gymnasium floor. A shower of sparks burst from the fixture. It's excellent shooting. I turn to the game makers. A few are nodding approval, but the majority of them are fixated on a roast pig that just arrived at their banquet table. Suddenly, I am furious that with my life on the line, they don't even have the decency to pay attention to me, that I'm being upstaged by a dead pig. My heart starts to pound. I can feel my face burning. Without thinking, I pull an arrow from my quiver and send it straight at the game maker's table. I hear shouts of alarm as people stumble back. The arrow skewers the apple in the pig's mouth and pins it to the wall behind it. Everyone stares at me in disbelief. Thank you for your consideration, I say. Then I give a slight bow and walk straight towards the exit without being dismissed. Ooh, we got a baddie.